Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, principal of D-Land Studios, Susanna Drake. Excuse me. My, my name is Susanna Drake. I'm the principal of, of D-Land Studio. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary firm in Brooklyn. And, um, and I'm here to talk about uh, ecology, public space, and infrastructure. Um, I want to start by suggesting that, um, or sort of dispelling a couple of, of myths. Um, one is that cities aren't about ecology. Um, the second is that landscape architects don't design cities. Um, and my third is that um, landscape architects and, and designers all wear black. So, um, so I, my goal in in, uh, in forming DLand Studio, um, I think this is our last slide. This is our last slide. I am I'm pressing point toward this. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. I am pointing to the right. This button. Well, in any case, um, my, my goal in, in uh, forming my practice is uh, to make cities work better. So in the context of, uh, of our TED, TED session today, I think it, it kind of falls in line. Um, the, the thinking behind this um, presentation is that there are a lot of uh, ecological approaches for an adaptation of infrastructure that can start to make our cities, cities work better. Um, and uh, one of the things that's sort of inherent to, uh, to urban systems is that we have a, a very sort of built up environment. And we have an environment that is filled with kind of monofunctional infrastructure systems. And we don't think of our cities as being sort of ecological or having a level of ecological productivity. Um, when we get the first slide up, um, I'll show you an image by Eric Sanderson, um, whose view, or who did this kind of back to the, the future kind of image of what Manhattan was and sort of reconstructed the city um, as its kind of pure ecology. And I show that in contrast to, there we go, to an image of, of the built city. Um, and, you know, as you can see, the built city is very gray. It's all about, oh, get back one. Um, oh, this one, this one. Okay, okay, now we're good. Okay, so as you can see, you know, when you look at New York City, um, there's very little green in this map. But this vision of Eric Sanderson in the Manhattan Project was this sort of green revisioning of, of, uh, of the, um, the city. So one of the, uh, sorry, I'm pointing the wrong way. Okay, sorry. Um, so when we think about movement in the city and the efficiency of, of urban infrastructure systems, um, you know, you can look at the, the vision up on the, on the top of, um, of these highways that run through the city. This is an image um, envisioned by Robert Moses. And that's kind of one way to think about how urban infrastructure can work. Um, but another way to consider uh, the ecology of the city and the, the functioning of it to make it more efficient is a layered approach, um, such as we see in Riverside Park, um, envisioned by Robert uh, by um, by Olmsted. Now, in this case, the the park was actually put over um, the tracks um, that you see in the map on the on the left, um, creating a much more um, sort of synthetic uh, system. So this is an image of the collect pond in Lower Manhattan, and here the the aquatic and the hydrologic systems have actually been um, are 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 shown as they existed historically, but they've been um, covered and contained, and as a result, in with the 1938 hurricane, um, this this is the the effect. Um, this is the water level um, from that period, and this was actually a, a hundred year storm, and this is all of of the of Lower Manhattan and Chinatown, and. Um, this was a 100-year storm, and that was about 73 years ago. So doing the math, you can um, consider that even um, without ideas of climate change, these kinds of storms are going to happen more frequently, and we need to prepare. 
So I'm going to talk about three projects today, um, three sites. Um, one, um, a project in Lower Manhattan, uh, thinking about the redevelopment of urban infrastructure. Another in the Gowanus Canal with a project that we call the Sponge Park. And the third, the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, running through Brooklyn and Queens. So I'll start with the BQE. Um, for, for a number of years, since I started my practice um, in 2005, um, we looked at, or we've been looking at, um, how to sort of heal the wounds of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway um, and how we might take these highway trenches and make them more environmentally productive. Now, if you look at the, the image, um, the rendering, um, on the side here, this was the vision that Robert Moses proposed. You know, he suggested that there could be this highway um, with these beautiful sort of green edges that could include parks and, and, and it would really be a park way. But when you look at the reality of what's been built, it's, it's very different. And so we started to actually equate um, uh, a new system of thinking about these, um, these systems, an ecological system with economics. And we did a lot of research and we discovered that um, with this uh, New York, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, forest, uh, US Forest Service data, there was this incredible study suggesting the environmental productivities in, of trees in, envir or in economic terms. And we discovered that even planting 360 trees along the edge of the canal would yield a $50 million gain over 10 years. And what we did was use that data to actually bring federal money to do further study on how we might start to implement a, a, a massive sort of tree planting along the corridor. So, and this is the, the sort of broad vision for how Carroll Gardens and uh, Cobble Hill might be transformed into a much more synthetic vision. This sort of looks back to, to Frederick Law Olmsted and thinking about how you might have these stacked infrastructures with the highway or the train systems um, sitting below a, a park system that could be an amenity for the community. It can be a flyway, it can be a place for, for bird and butterfly migrations. Um, so the next project I'm going to talk about is another way of thinking about sort of adding environmental productivity that has to do with water management in the city. Um, New, York, New York City has a, a really significant issue of having a combined sewer overflow problem where 400 million gallons of combined sewage and uh, stormwater go into the harbor every week. Um, and so what that means is you can see in the image um, over to the, on the bottom, that you end up with very polluted waterways that have a lot of uh, sewage effluent um, floating in them. Um, so what we're trying to do is actually create a series of more permeable open spaces that can help to absorb the surface water runoff so you don't get as much of this combined effluent. So one of the, the sort of early things that we did was to look at the watershed boundaries. And I don't know if all of you are familiar with what a watershed is, but basically you have a sort of high point that exists um, around an area, and all of the water from that high point flows into um, the, the streams or wetlands um, that, that are at the bottom of the hill. And you don't really think of New York City as having a lot of topography necessarily, but, but it does. And there are a whole series of these watersheds. There are also things called sewer sheds, which are really the jurisdictional um, boundaries of how the water is managed. And so we mapped both um, in this diagram. And you can see that there is this significant issue of the water on the streets. Now, Lest you think it's uh, really simple to actually um, work in New York City on these green infrastructure systems um, and that all the agencies are really willing to all you know, come together, on, on some levels it, it can be. Um, in this administration, um, great strides have been made to actually have the, the agencies work together. But for instance, the DOT, the DEP, and the Parks Department are all under the jurisdictions of um, different deputy mayors. So they all have different funding sources, and so it's a challenge to actually bring them all together and have them work together. But um, the, with the uh, Mayor's Office of Long-Term Sustainability, they've managed to um, put together memoranda of understanding to start to have uh, the financing actually come under one pot um, to bring all of the, the groups together to, to build these systems, these new systems. And um, the, the other, with the complication with the, the Gowanus Canal, though, is that it's also a um, DEP Superfund site. So we had federal jurisdictions, and you know, it, I could do a whole TED talk just on this particular, <laughs> this particular um, topic. Um, 
but in the interest of, interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, so when you, when you think back to that, um, that watershed map, what we did with that was actually calculate that we needed 11 acres of permeable ground in order to absorb all the surface water runoff. So we looked for what the opportunities might be in the Gowanus area and created a framework um, into which you know, a lot of different designers could, could plug in their, their work. Um, and a lot of different developers and landowners could operate. And the idea was that we would um, subscribe or, or prescribe a level of environmental productivity rather than specific sort of design, um, uh, uh, formal design elements. And the exciting thing now is that, you know, this new productive landscape has gotten a lot of attention um, and is getting a lot of buy-in from the, the city, the state, the federal agencies, as well as the local community. And we're actually doing a, a pilot project for the first street end um, with funding from uh, the DEP um, through a grant, uh, through grants from city council, as well as some um, individual uh, foundation funding that we found from the New England um, Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. So I guess what, what I want to point out in this is that, you know, if you want to make these projects happen, um, it really helps to be very entrepreneurial and think about sort of creative sources of funding. You know, you can wait for the projects to happen or you can go ahead and, and, and have a dream and, and envision something and then try to find out how to, or try to figure out a way to make it work. Um, so, you remember back to the, the, the image I showed you of, of Chinatown flooded. Um, in 2010, we worked on the uh, Rising Currents exhibition um, with uh, ARO. And we, tr we looked at a new vision for Lower Manhattan of how to, um, to manage climate change and sea level rise. And um, looking at sort of pro climate change projections, um, sort of ag slightly aggressive climate change projections, we can anticipate potentially a, a, a six foot sea level rise over the next 80 years. And so looking at this map, you can see all of the green areas would actually be underwater. And some of the upland areas are areas that would be impacted quite heavily by a storm surge. And the storm surge is when you get a big sort of wave of, of flood water, and that's all salt water coming into the city. Um, so it's really something that, that we need to plan for, or we're going to be in trouble. Um, we've we've uh, successively hardened the edges of the city. Um, if you look at, at the map on the top, that's a historic image of our bulkheading, and we did this to facilitate exchange, right? So um, early on um, in the 1850s, you can see how we cut slips into the edge of the city um, so that the boats could actually come in. And then later in the 60s, um, we have these finger piers that sort of stick out from the edge. But as shipping has moved away from Manhattan, we've ended up with this recreational edge surrounding the city. And, you know, that's, it's, it's wonderful to have that recreational space, but we really need to be thinking back to the, um, how climate change might, might impact these newly developed areas. Um, if you look at this map, you may be able to see a similarity between the area where um, there's this sort of upland area um, here um, and that historic coastline. You know, we've really filled out all of this, this zone. And the, uh, the six-foot sea level rise actually implies uh, a 21% loss or impact on lower Manhattan. And the storm surge uh, suggests a 61% loss. So, you know, you can think of the institutions and the businesses that are down there, like the New York Stock Exchange and like Goldman Sachs and like the 9-11 Memorial and, and a lot of sort of very important cultural institutions as well. So we need to plan. So what we did was come up with this sort of hybrid system. Um, the system manages the upland um, freshwater inputs that are happening right now, you know, to manage the 400 million gallons of sewage effluent entering the harbor. So we have this series of green streets for the upland freshwater. And then we have this edge condition to buffer the waves coming in. And then also a series of, of wetlands that can help to manage um, the water that will come in and then flow out along that edge. So we have this whole system of adapted infrastructure. We're taking all of the, the infrastructure that's now in the streets, the, the gas pipes and the sewage pipes and the water pipes and the, the um, fiber optic um, 
uh, cables, and we're putting the public infrastructure in one set of vaults under, under one side of the sidewalk, and the, the pro, uh, public infrastructure under the other side of the sidewalk. And what that does is it frees up all of the space under the streets to be a permeable ground into which water can flow, just regular rain, right? Um, and the idea is that that potentially frees up 28% of the city, which is now roadbed, um, for a new sort of permeable landscape. And you can see that we also, in this system, we have that as sort of the, the main um, infrastructure system. And then we also have, as you can see, the detail of the wetland edges with, with uh, walkways out over it to create a new kind of urban experience, as well as these new sponge slips, which can take water out to the edge of the, or back into the harbor, basically, in the case of a, of a big flood. So the idea is to make this new kind of resilient city. And I, um, you know, the, the MoMA project was a wonderful sort of culmination of, of a lot of these issues in, in looking at the roads and the upland um, water systems as well as this edge condition. And, you know, we're really trying to, to take on um, the problem of how to make the city more ecologically productive by stacking these infrastructure systems. And, you know, we're doing that in a, in a small way um, while trying to sort of facilitate economic exchange as well with an active harbor. But hopefully through a series of these smaller interventions, um, we can start to impact uh, our whole region and make a healthier ecological region. And then ultimately a health healthier ecological um, planet and a more sustainable planet. So thank you very much. <laughs>